All right. Well, I want to thank you very much for uh, just bringing me into your church. It's so amazing in the wonders of technology that we can uh, we can do that. I'm sitting here in a cozy studio on our property uh, next to our house. Uh, it's we're getting about six to eight inches of snow here in the mountains, and uh, it's uh, at least that's what they're calling for. And I'm just delighted that I don't have to get out and drive anywhere or fly anywhere. So thanks for for setting this up. It's my pleasure. I want to talk to you. Uh, I've titled this "How to Interpret the News." Now, uh, Brother Don asked for me to kind of focus on a little bit on, uh, obviously, on Bible prophecy and how that fits in with the broader picture from Satan's perspective of trying to take over the world. And so, as I was thinking about this over the last few weeks, uh, this is something that I've wanted to do, kind of tie it up together around this common theme for for a while. So you guys are kind of the recipients of this uh, of this new presentation, but. I'm calling it How to Interpret the News. Uh, I'll mention this here at the beginning and then maybe again at the end, but a lot of this information comes from my uh, my two books, Spirit of the Antichrist, Volumes 1 and 2, and then the third installment in that is the one that just came out last month, and that's called Spirit of the False Prophet, Rise of the Global Technology. Now, I want to be sure that our speaking of technology is uh, working well. Are you guys able to see the screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Perfect. I'm, I'm not showing that you're recording. Okay, I'm recording it on a different. I'm recording it using a different app. So. Okay. Got it. All right. So those are the those are the three book series. Uh, some of you probably already have those. If you uh, would like to get them, since we're not there together when we don't have our resource tables, uh, you can just go to our website, notbyworks.org, or we've set up separate web pages that you can go directly for each book: Spirit of the Antichrist.org and Spirit of the False Prophet.org. But. Um, I want to introduce this topic to kind of show you why this is important. And let, let me tell you where we're headed. I'm going to give you a, f a few uh, pre preliminary principles uh, that kind of undergird what I'm talking about. Uh, if I had time, if this was a longer conference, if I was speaking multiple times, I would flesh out each of these principles in a little greater detail. But for the purposes of our time together, I'm just going to kind of go through them quickly. And then the meat of the presentation will be three things to consider when interpreting the news. Uh, but to set all that up, I want to give you a few examples of what I call real fake news. Um, there are hundreds of these types of things out there. I just picked a few short clips that I wanted to show you. The first one is an older clip, but it shows you that uh, this has been going on for decades, that the media has been controlled uh, since really since the turn of the 20th century when they took over the print media and radio media, later TV media. Uh, Operation Mockingbird, uh, they've admitted, is still in force. Uh, I've talked about that in, in volume one of, of my book series. Uh, but this is, goes back to 1991. It was during the full, first Gulf War, and it's a CNN clip. And I, as you watch this, and this was aired live at the time. Uh, it's a not the greatest video quality because this was before we had digital technology and it was kind of early stages of cable television. But um, uh, as you watch this, it's about a two and a half minute clip. I want you to remember this important piece of information, and that is that these two uh, reporters, uh, Charles Jaco, uh, who you see on the screen there, and the guy that he's going to bring on in just a moment, they are not, in fact, in Saudi Arabia. They are on the roof of the CNN building in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and the whole thing was uh, staged. So listen to this. Uh, that's, uh, that's about it uh, for right now. We'll get back to you when we know something else. Something is happening here. We're watching. We're scanning the skies for something else uh, coming in. But uh, right now, we uh, can't uh, see much of anything. And frankly, this is what we can show you on television right now because of uh, military restrictions from both the uh, Saudis and uh, the U.S. Uh, CD, if you need to take cover, I notice uh, that you've got your gas mask in your hands. If you need to put it on, we, we have, please do so. If you need to take cover, have, please do so. Uh, if, you are able, if you are able to take a question, uh, did you think that the possible threat would be over because it is now morning there? It's what, well, just after the, 6 o'clock in the morning? The, yeah, the whole thing is everyone assumed that the threat would be over because it was uh, early morning. But the thing about Saddam Hussein is that he has never done 
the expected and right now we have uh, you know once again been uh, surprised with the unexpected um, an air raid of an apparent attack although we can't say what the outgoing missiles hit at approximately 20 after 7 in the morning Saudi Arabian time um, all the other attacks have occurred from 10 o'clock at night till 4 3 4 in the morning this is the first one to take place uh, in eastern Saudi Arabia in the daylight hours now that sound you hear behind me is the um, hotel people are looking up in the sky scanning the skies to see what they can see do we see much of anything out there can we, can we see much of anything okay well apparently there was there was yeah there was some word of uh of uh outgoing again there we cannot be specific about the direction all right, we are now led to understand that there are also firings in another city in Saudi Arabia. Uh, CNN's Carl Rochelle is, is here with me. He just came up. Uh, Carl, I know we can't be very specific given these restrictions, but uh, within those parameters, what did you see? Well, what I saw, I, I didn't see anything hit. I looked very, almost straight above us. There is a vapor trail coming from my right to my left, and there's a cloud of uh, something. It looks like it might have been an explosion, a cloud. Uh, the white say <laughs> He's uh, putting on a gas mask. There hasn't been any gas dropped here that we can tell. Uh, and the the whole thing was fake and staged. And that's just one of, like I said, hundreds of examples that happens all the time, even still uh, to this day. They they really, you know, were acting it up. I mean, they were, you know, we've got gas, mustard gas coming in or whatever they thought it was. They've got, you know, si sirens going on. Um, uh, un unbelievable. Here's this next clip is about a minute and a half. And this is a fellow that's essentially um, talking about another example. And these first two are from CNN, but I've got one from Fox News because we're going to talk about how there's no difference. Uh, but he's talking about how CNN more recently was faking uh, a report where they said that Nancy Grace was joining them by satellite when in fact they were actually right next to each other in the parking lot. Watch this minute and a half clip. Nancy Grace and Ashley Banfield from CNN were doing like a split screen interview. You know, these interviews where it's like one person's in one location, one person's in the other. And they were talking about uh, uh, crime stories, including the story about um, the Cleveland kidnapping and, and uh, you, you know, the whole story with Charles Ramsey, the witness, etc. And as people looked more closely at it, they noticed that they both were in Phoenix. And then as people looked even more closely, they realized that they were in the same parking lot, probably just a few feet away from each other. This is very, very weird. Let me show you a couple of images here. If you'll look at this one, and Natan, maybe you can pick this up. You see this red SUV drive behind Ashley Banfield and then immediately behind <laughs> Nancy Grace. And it's abundantly clear that they're just, they're, they're sitting in the same parking lot doing the interview. And then if we go to another one of these images, you'll see that uh, the same truck goes by both of them simultaneously. And uh, hard hitting satellite interview. The funniest part is that in this shot, Nancy Grace is holding her earpiece like she's having trouble hearing. You know, Nancy, you might be able to hear Ashley better if you take the earpiece out and just listen to her live audio, like because she's standing right next to you. Why, why would this even happen? And then again, if you look at this image, you see that the same truck and bus drive behind each of them and nancy grace still struggling to hear her because uh of the satellite distance and delay between them um sad all right so uh you know what what i'm uh, what i'm trying to illustrate with these is that nothing is as it appears and uh, we have been being con controlled and programmed for quite some time uh, this is a short montage that uh, someone put together, uh, even using CNN's own clips, bragging about their media technology. And But I want you to listen carefully to the types of technology they have. And then he even shows a few clips of where they can use that same, you know, Hollywood Studios type technology to create uh, the news. Have cinema quality HD cameras, cinema quality HD lenses, an extensive lighting system with dimmers, a sophisticated audio system and gear, and everything else you're likely to need on site and ready to go. 
do elite quality green screen production from our huge three-walled, pre-lit cyclorama and put our amazing Ultimat 11 HD chroma keyer to work. Or, better yet, use our HD 3D virtual studio system along with our industry-leading Encodacam and coded camera frame and save hundreds of thousands of dollars on set construction costs alone. In fact, our set designer also designed sets for NBC, CNBC, and CNN. So, again, you can see how easy it is to manipulate people. You never know where they are. This, they've been caught doing this. All the networks, the Weather Channel, Fox, CNN, especially with, uh, like, reporting on hurricanes. They'll, be, they'll look like they're out in the middle of the storm with the hair blowing, the wind blowing fiercely, the umbrellas. Uh, but it's all in a studio. Not always, but quite frequently. And the bottom line is you never know for sure. Uh, that what you're looking at is legitimate. Uh, here's Fox News. This is interesting. It's not a, a video per se, but uh, back during the Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, uh, you know, charges uh, in connection with Jeffrey Epstein, they uh, Fox News wanted to show a photo. So they picked a photo from Mar-a-Lago, uh, readily available online at Getty Images. You can find it even to this day through Getty Images. And it showed Donald Trump, his then girlfriend Melania, and uh, uh, and then Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. Uh, but, of course, they can't have Donald Trump be in a picture with Jeffrey Epstein, so they just edited Trump out. Watch this. That's the original photo, and this is what they showed in the background as they were interviewing Jordan Merson. So the bottom line is deception is getting worse and worse and worse. You never know uh, what you're looking at, whether it's real uh, or not. Uh, the, the Bible tells us that things are going to get worse and worse in these last days. In fact, people are going to be giving heed in the last days uh, to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. And that's really the premise of this last 17 years worth of research that I've been doing that ended up culminating in these uh, three books. It's the, 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 this, the premise is that we know what's going to happen during the tribulation period, the future 70th week of Daniel, which we'll talk about in a moment. But if those things are going to happen then, and we're getting closer and closer, then it follows we would see an upsurge in that kind of thing today. And boy, do we, as I uh, outline in detail in, uh, in the two books. Uh, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the coming of the lawless one, that's the future Antichrist who will rule the world uh, with his sidekick, the false prophet, who's the subject of my latest book, uh, he'll rule in, in complete tyranny. Uh, under the behest of Satan. And when this guy comes, he's going to be coming according to the working of Satan. Notice, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception. So John tells us in 1 John 4, 1, that we should not believe uh, every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so I want to kind of talk with you today about how to uh, interpret the news, but let me go over some preliminary principles first. Now, some of these may be for some of you, uh, although it sounds like it's a fairly friendly crowd. Uh, appreciate those of you that follow our, our ministry. Thank you for that. Uh, but for some of you, this may be uh, somewhat hard to, to swallow at first to pass. Uh, but I want to encourage you, as we do with all of our resources, don't just take my word for it. Study this uh, on your own. I, in all of my books, I give 50, 60 pages, in some cases, of bibliographic citations. Everything I say in there is cited. You can go back and find it by just looking at the quote from the book and finding that person's name in the back or the article or the magazine, that kind of thing. 
Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I, I, this is the, an educated uh, conclusion based on many years of study. Uh, if, if you're not sure if you agree, that's fine. I, that's wonderful. I, I love healthy debate and I love healthy research. So check these out for yourself. But here's some preliminary principles before we get to the three questions that you need to consider when you watch the mainstream news or any news today uh, online or on TV or magazines, newspapers, you name it. So the first principle is this, almost nothing is as it seems. You know, we live in a world of time, space, and matter, but it's a world that is really reflective of a cosmic battle of a spiritual struggle between God and Satan. We're going to talk a lot about that uh, this morning. Uh, but almost nothing is as it's seen. One of the inscriptions that I have, I think it's in the first volume, is from Leonardo da Vinci, who said there are three classes of people, those who see, those who see when they're shown, and those who do not see. And uh, what we've tried to do in these books is, is show people, show people the facts, show people how we've been deceived, and show how all of it correlates with Bible prophecy, and God is working out His plan precisely as He said He would. So almost nothing is as it's seen. Number two, it is seldom about what it's about. A lot of times you'll hear me say it's never about what it's about. When I catch myself, I, I do try to soften that a little because, you know, sometimes real organic things do happen. It's, it's just the nature of life. But most of the time, uh, it's not about what it's about. In fact, I love what uh, William Casey, the former CIA director under Reagan during his entire term, uh, he said, quote, we will know our disinformation campaign is complete when everything the American public believes is a lie. Principle number three is there is no difference between the Republicrats and the Democans. So if you're still wrapped up in the right-left paradigm, I encourage you to read that chapter in volume one. I also address it a little bit in volume two. Um, but the fact of the matter is we can document when they decided to go to the two-party system, what their motives were for that, and that it's just all theater. It's like a Don King-sponsored fight. It doesn't matter who wins. The oligarchs get richer. Uh, you know, it's, it's like a wrestling match. It's, it's, a, it's Coke versus Pepsi. It's really no, not much of a difference. So there is no difference between the Republicrats and the Democrats. Uh, I've interviewed a lot of people behind the scenes, congressmen, uh, senators, uh, and, uh, you know, got on official, you know, admissions of this uh, on camera in to varying uh, degrees. But I love this cartoon. Ben Garrison uh, kind of talks about the march toward tyranny, left, right, left, right. And, and, and really, they, they intentionally need to have us feel like we have a voice. And so they divide us we're already divided into two philosophical camps. There's no question there's a difference between the liberals and the, uh, the conservatives philosophically and morally and otherwise. But the notion that somehow one party represents one and, one and the other represents the other is simply false. It's completely manufactured. Uh, they, as Carol Quigley points out in his book, Tragedy and Hope, he was the historian for the CFR for years professor at Georgetown and a number of other elite schools, mostly at Georgetown. Uh, but he exposed back in the 60s the fact that they went to the two-party system intentionally so that every four years we could, quote, throw the rascals out, but in reality nothing ever changes. And so uh, I deal with this in great, much greater detail in the book. But all you have to do is just look at history, and you know that if there was really a difference then at any point in U.S. history, if we could just get a Republican in the White House, a Republican-controlled Congress, a Republican-controlled Senate, and a majority of Supreme Courts, or as we have today, a so-called supermajority of justices appointed by Republican presidents, then we would be able to do everything uh, to re you know, return us to our constitutional values. But in fact, it's getting worse and worse and worse. Uh, nothing uh, ever changes. Number four is there's no difference, and this kind of follows from that, there's no difference between Fox News and CNN. Uh, if I had had time, I would have shown you similar quotes and examples from Fox News, but you can go to a search engine and search. And it's getting harder to find those kinds of things because everything is more controlled now. Uh, when I first went down this rabbit hole uh, 17, 18 years ago, I fortunately uh, was able to save to uh, external hard drives a lot of videos from YouTube that You'll never find out there now hundreds of them uh, that are now uh, safely put away in a safe uh, for uh, research. But there's no difference between Fox News and CNN. You know, I've talked about this before. Maybe you've seen this in some of my other presentations. But back 
in the day, this is what a horse-drawn manure spreader uh, looked like. As things went on, it got a little bit fancier, a little bit more sturdy. Eventually, in the industrial age, it started to look like this. But today, this is what the modern manure spreaders uh, look like. It's all propaganda. There's a reason they call it uh, programming. And uh, we need to remember that, that you know we can watch them to get information and to see, and this is what this whole presentation is about, is how do you interpret it, to see kind of what they're promoting, uh, but to always do so eyes wide open. Number five is there are powerful people in government who worship Satan and love death. Satan loves death. Jesus told us he's a killer from the beginning. He's a murderer. Uh, they love death. I have several uh, times in both books, all three books actually, where I address the depopulation and eugenics agenda that goes way, way back to the uh, you know 15th, 16th centuries. Uh, I mean, it goes back to the Garden of Eden, but in in more recent times. Um, and so there are actually people in the U.S. government and in, in every government uh, who worship Satan uh, and love death. And so I talk about, for example, the Bohemian Grove, where they gather once a year. I give have a whole uh, section on this in uh, Volume 2, and I go through secret societies. But they gather, wear their satanic druid costumes, and they uh, you know, lay down their conscience at the altar of the burning owl. And every major political figure you know, worldwide, every major business person, every wealthy person, news commentators like Walter Cronkite and the like have all attended. Here's a picture uh, from one of the previous Bohemian Groves uh, showing Nixon and, and Reagan. Uh, number six, however bad you think things are, they are actually much worse. One of the biggest reasons most people don't understand and are not awake, as da Vinci said, to uh, the Luciferian conspiracy is something called cognitive dissonance. They just cannot allow themselves to believe something that shakes their, their normalcy bias. They've, they've come to accept things the way they are. Uh, they've, been, uh, gr they've grown up in that culture, and they've been taught these things. And so they just, they just when you tell them some of these things, they just look at you like you're, you're nuts. There's no way that could possibly be true. But what I want you to understand is when you hear these things, not only should you assume that in most cases they are true. I mean, certainly there are made up misinformation and disinformation conspiracies out there that are not true. I'm a big time conspiracy theorist, but I only believe the conspiracies that are true. Um, so I, I admit there are some that are not true. But generally speaking, it's a good rule of thumb that when you hear something that you think there's no way this could be true, not only is it true, but it's actually much worse. Will, much worse. William Bloom was a very well-connected uh, you know, foreign policy a guy, writer, author. Uh, here's a quote from his book, Rogue State, A Guide to the World's Only Superpower. He says, quote, no matter how paranoid or conspiracy minded you are, what the government is actually doing is worse than you can imagine. And we could look at quotes from uh, Hitler's uh, right hand man, Joseph Mengele. He said, the more we do to you, the less you seem to believe we're doing it. I think that's a, a very stark uh, a foreboding reminder of where we're headed. Number seven, the U.S. does not have elections. We have selections. So this has been true ever since they went to digital vote tabulation machines many decades ago. I was talking about uh, this problem, uh, Dominion, mentioning it by name in my first book on this subject way back in 2012. It was called The Great Last Day's Deception. Of course, nobody was really talking about it much. Uh, some people were, but in the church, very few were, because we bought into the right-left paradigm. The problem is the right-left paradigm is just an illusion. It, it's what I call Calvinist uh, voting. It really doesn't make uh, much of a difference. Uh, you can take your pick. Left, right, it's going to end up in uh, full-spectrum planetary control, just like the Bible says uh, it will. Number eight, the, the president, the Supreme Court, U.S. Senate, and almost all U.S. congressmen are controlled. All media is controlled. So when you see things happening and you see the storylines, just remember it's good theater, it's good script writing, uh, and uh, sometimes it's good script writing, sometimes it's not even all that good, um, but it's not organic. Uh, the whole thing recently with the Speaker of the House, um, complete theater, uh, I've said on air this week on a couple of radio shows, be very, very leery of Mike Johnson. Uh, I know exactly where they're headed with this. This was all by design. He is not who you think he is. Um, number nine, there is a very strong chance your favorite conservative pundit is controlled. You know, we look at people, we love to have a voice. We love a lot of what they say. We agree in principle with a lot of what they say in their books and in their commentaries on TV and so forth. But the reality is they are controlled. 
in one of my books, I think it was volume two, uh, I was making this point and I, you know, I made a, what I didn't realize at the time was a prescient statement about Tucker Carlson, uh, that he would be, he, they, they would toss him aside when they were through with him and he's just playing a role. He's a mouthpiece. Uh, and sure enough, that, that happened and people reminded me and they would sent me quotes from the book saying, how did you know? And I, I didn't know. I just was, you know, saying what's obvious from uh, from years of studying this stuff. Number 10, and the final preliminary principle, most of history we have been taught since 1900 is false. 1900 is a key date, that, that whole turn of the, the late 19th century, early 20th century is a key time in U.S. history as it relates to the globalists' plan to, to bring down America and usher in the New World System. I talk about this in the books. I won't go into it uh, now. We may get into it a little bit here as I go through the rest of the presentation. But a few quotes that co sort of affirm this uh, important uh, preliminary principle. Leo Tolstoy said, History would be a wonderful thing if only it were true. Napoleon Bonaparte said, What is history but a fable agreed upon? After World War II, Churchill said, History will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorne Clemens, he understood this principle. He said, The very ink with which history is written is merely fluid prejudice. And of course, uh, George Orwell, Eric Arthur Blair, he said, Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. And that's why in the early 1900s, they took over the textbook industry. They controlled what was written there. And to this day, they're still scrubbing history right out of 1984. So with that background, uh, and I hope that you'll, uh, you know, give me some leeway with those principles and uh, just, you know, kind of let's start from that premise. I'd love to dialogue with you more about it. If you have questions or so forth, you can email me uh, offline. But let's talk about three questions to consider when interpreting uh, the news. Three questions to consider when interpreting the news. This is the lens through which we should watch, read, and hear the news if we're truly awake. Uh, you know, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Uh, so the first question is, what are the implications for Bible prophecy? When you see something unfolding on the TV screen, ask yourself, how does this correlate to God's plan of the ages? Remember, there is a God. He's the creator God. He spoke the world into existence in six literal 24-hour days about 6,000 years ago. He's working out his plan just as he's told us he would in his roadmap, the Word of God, the revealed written scripture. Uh, from Genesis to Revelation, he tells us a beginning and an end. Uh, the Bible begins with in the beginning, but very few people take the time to look at the end. It does have a clear ending. We're headed someplace. And so we ought to view all of life through the lens of Bible prophecy. You know, 16% of Scripture is unfulfilled Bible prophecy. So if you don't study Bible prophecy, then you're only getting 84% of the Word of God. And I think he wants us to know the whole counsel of God. Jesus told the first century Jewish leaders, uh, he called them hypocrites, uh, because he says, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. And sadly, many people today in the present age are making the same mistake. Uh, we understand the weather. You know, first thing I did when I got up this morning was look at the weather and, and see if, if the storm they had said or the winter weather they were predicting uh, had materialized for this weekend. And sure enough, it's still uh, there. And I can look out and I can see the clouds. Now, of course, these days, a lot of it is manufactured. It's manipulated. It's through geoengineering. I have a whole entire chapter on that in Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume 1. But still, whether it's manufactured or organic, you can still see what's coming. But for some reason, people can't do that spiritually or choose not to do that when it comes to God's plan of the ages. In reference to his second coming, Jesus said, when you see these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing nigh. Paul tells the church that we should be eagerly waiting for the Savior. We need to remember our citizenship is in heaven. We're just passing through. Um, uh, he says, uh, oh, that's the same verse of Philippians 3.20. So uh, if, you, if you look at God's plan of the ages from a panoramic view, from creation to the present, what we find is that in the final age, we're living in the church age right now, 
But in the final age, there's going to be a transition uh, known as the, the tribulation period or the 70th week of Daniel, which I'm going to explain in just a moment. But that transition period will be the culmination of prophetic history leading us into the final age, the kingdom age, that glorious age when Christ comes back in fulfillment of prophecy, takes the throne and rules in perfect peace and righteousness and justice. But right now we're living in the last days. The Bible calls this the last days because as you can see from that chart on the screen, indeed it's the final age prior to the kingdom age. So what an exciting time to be alive. And I believe very strongly based on the signs of the times that we're living in the last of the last days. Now uh, we can't set a date. I, I'm not claiming that God revealed something to me in a you know, a bowl of spaghetti or something. I don't have any special revelation, but I can just tell you, following the principles of Scripture and looking at the signs of the times and seeing how the stage is being set, I don't believe it's going to be much longer. Uh, I also believe that the Luciferians, who I'm going to introduce here in just a moment, uh, they have t telegraphed for us what their target date is for ushering in the one world system politically, religiously, and economically. And we're, it's all coming to a head uh, right now. Uh, in fact, Paul says in the last days, the present age, perilous times will come. Well, guess what? They've come. You go back and read chapter 3. It reads uh, like uh, the headlines from uh, today, 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're living in these perilous times. Uh, John, going back to John, says it is the last hour, a synonym for the last days. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know it is the last hour. So as we think about this first question to ask, how does it relate to Bible prophecy? We need to, we need to understand the key prophecy in all of the Bible as it relates to the end time. This is absolutely foundational. If you've not studied, and I suspect that you have, but if you've not studied Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, let me give you a quick primer on it uh, here for the next five minutes or so. This, this really helps us understand where the world is heading. So to set the stage, uh, Daniel, you know, five centuries or so before Christ, uh, is uh, living during the end of the prophesied 70-year captivity that Jeremiah had prophesied about, the Lord had showed uh, Jeremiah. He realizes that 70 years is coming to an end, and so he, he prays, and uh, he asks the Lord here in chapter 9, what comes next? Now, Daniel gives us a ton of prophetic information, chapter 2 with the statue, uh, chapter 7 uh, with Daniel's vision of the beasts, uh, chapters 11 and 12 about the future uh, Antichrist, and so much more. But chapter 9 really gives us, uh, pinpoints for us, uh, how this next phase of God's plan after Jeremiah's 70-year captivity for Israel is going to unfold. So I'm going to walk you through this uh, prophecy. We don't have time to, to read it and, and, and go verse by verse, but I'll give you kind of a high-level cliffs notes of what's happening here. So Daniel says the next phase of God's plan is not going to be 70 years like Jeremiah's, but 70 times 7. 70 Shabuas, that's the Hebrew word translated in most English Bibles, weeks. So that's why it's often called the 70 weeks prophecy. But a Shabuah is a seven-year period. So it's not going to be 70 years like it was in the, in the previous prophecy, but the next phase of God's plan for Israel involves 70 seven-year periods, or 70 Shabuas, or as I call it on the screen there, a 490-year plan. And Daniel tells us exactly each step of the way when these the, this plan is going to unfold. So he starts out and he says, from A until B uh, will be 69 Shabuas, or weeks, which is 483 years. So the first phase is going to be 69 weeks or 69 seven-year periods. Well, what what is A? And by the way, the words in yellow there are straight out of the Hebrew text. They're time words. It's a beginning from this starting point uh, until this point is the idea. Well, what is A? A was the decree of Artaxerxes to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which occurred March 5th, 444 BC. We read about that in Nehemiah. I just finished teaching through Nehemiah at my home church, Plum Creek Chapel. So that's when the, the clock started ticking on that first 483 years. Uh, if you do the math, 483 years on the Hebrew calendar at that time it was 360 days per year. You come up with 173,880 days. Now today we reckon uh, time according to the Gregorian calendar a little bit differently. 
Uh, so, but the, a day is always a day, 24 hours. So if you take that 173,880 days and you start at what is now known as March 5th, 444 BC, and you march forward 173,880 days, you happen to arrive, I say happen tongue in cheek, this is precisely what God was intending to do. And in, in his prophecies always are fulfilled precisely as he wants them to be. But it lands right on the date of tr- of Christ's triumphal entry, that fateful Passion Week when he ended up making his way up the Via Dolorosa and paid uh, his, the, your penalty and mine on the cross for our sins. Uh, March 30th, 33 AD. So in other words, uh, Daniel's prophecy says, know and understand this from the restoring, uh, from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince has come will be 483 years and exactly That's what happened. Christ rode into Jerusalem in fulfillment of uh, the Old Testament on the back of a donkey. Of course, there was a splattering of uh, Jewish people at the time who cried, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But within days, those cries by the national leaders and the marauding mobs that were ginned up by them changed to crucify him, crucify him. But going back to Daniel's prophecy, Daniel tells us in Daniel 9 that after that, after Messiah has come, some things are going to happen. Uh, after that 69th week, uh, we get to C. So from A to B is 483 years. C takes place after that. And what are those things that take place? Well, this Messiah is going to be cut off, which he was uh, a few days later. And a few decades later, the city and the temple will be destroyed, which they were in 70 AD by uh, the Romans. Uh, So then the next time word that we see is the word then. And he says, then after these things... Uh, the next phase is going to begin, which is the final seven years of the prophecy. So we've had 69 weeks. We have one week left. We've had 483 years in history, but there's still one seven-year period uh, remaining. And, 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 and after that, after the Messiah is cut off and the temple is destroyed, the uh, Antichrist will sign a covenant, confirm a covenant uh, with Israel, uh, with many, between Israel and many, uh, we can talk later about what that many is, but it's all of these nations right now that are in the news surrounding uh, Israel for one final seven-year uh, period. So uh, if you just look at what's on the screen, that's Daniel's prophecy in a nutshell. And notice the final seven-year period has not begun yet. We're still living in this gap of time between the 69th week and the 70th week, which Daniel's prophecy clearly explains. There's going to be some things that happen outside of the 490-year plan. The 483 years have already happened. The final seven years happen in the future. The New Testament comes along, and God reveals in the New Testament the church age as also taking place in this gap of time. Paul calls it a mystery. Uh, it's essentially a parenthesis, if you will, uh, in this uh, you know flow of thought with Daniel's uh, prophecy. Now, we don't know when this final seven-year period is going to happen. That's what is going to usher in the return of the Messiah to set up his kingdom on earth. It, it leads up to the final cosmic battle, the battle of Armageddon. So if you look at a end times chart, uh, you can see right in the middle there that seven-year tribulation or Daniel's 70th week. It starts with the signing of the covenant in, in Daniel 9.27. It ends with Armageddon and the second coming of Christ. We're still living in the church age. This is obviously not drawn to scale, but we're living in this church age. Uh, between the 69th and 70th weeks of Daniel. We don't know when that 70th week uh, is going to begin. The book of Revelation also perfectly correlates with Daniel. Uh, It's amazing. In fact, uh, in most seminaries, when you study the book of Daniel, you study it simultaneously with the book of Revelation because it tells the same tale. Uh, Revelation, contrary to popular opinion, is not difficult to understand at all. It's one of the easiest books in the Bible to outline. The first three chapters deal with seven literal churches in the first century that Christ had a message for. Chapters four and five set the stage for the outpouring of God's wrath that is to come. Who is worthy to open the seals of God's wrath? The Lamb, He is worthy. The seals are open in chapter six. The wrath begins. It lasts for seven years. It includes a series of judgments and several other things taking place. Fascinating uh, study. Uh, But you get to chapter 19, Christ comes back. Chapter 20 is the millennial phase of the kingdom. And chapters 21 and 22, uh, the eternal state. So if we think about the news, you need to understand what's going on in the news relative to this roadmap of Bible prophecy. And so let's talk quickly here about 
human government. I'm going to fly through this because I've talked about it in other presentations, but it's kind of important to understand from a human perspective how human government is really, you know, developing exactly the way God intended for it to. So there are three phases to God's human civil government, we might call it, on earth. It started with a globalist government, divine globalism. God told Adam and Eve, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the whole earth. Uh, And the whole earth indeed did have one language and one speech. But something happened at the Tower of Babel, and after that we have a shift to nationalism in God's human government. God uh, said uh, to Nimrod and the people there, come let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so that was about 2242 BC, about a hundred years after the flood. And God at that time established uh, nationalism, divine uh, nationalism. And then we get into a return, if you will, to globalism. One day, God's divine plan is going to come full circle back to globalism. It's going to occur in two phases, two stages, if you will. First, there'll be satanic globalism. This is going back to Daniel and talking about that fourth kingdom, the revived Roman Empire, that's going to devour the whole earth. Uh, But when Christ comes back to take the throne, globalism will take on an entirely new nature, Back to divine globalism, the Bible tells a story that returns to a pre-fall Edenic state in uh, the the garden, just as it was before uh, the fall. God provided redemption, uh, solved man's predicament that we got ourselves into, and one day all the nations will go up from year to year to worship the king, as Zechariah tells us. Uh, Solomon, one of only two psalms written by Solomon, he tells us, let the whole earth be filled with his glory. I talked about this psalm on a podcast uh, this week. Uh, and then you, you see Isaiah, this famous passage that we read a lot at Christmas. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That's the first advent. The rest of Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 all relates to the second advent. The government will be upon his shoulder. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. That's not happening today. It doesn't take uh, a genius to figure that out. Uh, Obviously, there are governments that are not subject to God's divine order and certainly not bowing down and worshiping the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So if we go back to my plan of the ages chart and overlay this civil government model, uh, the first two ages was a globalist model. We are now living in the nationalist model of human government, but we will return someday once again to a divine globalism. Right now, in the present age, we need to remember that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So I believe we are teetering right here on the brink of a return to globalism. And remember, that happens in two phases. First, satanic globalism, and then ultimately divine globalism. And by the way, there is nothing biblically or prophetically that precludes a return to satanic globalism prior to the rapture. So we're promised that the rapture will take place before the great day of the Lord's wrath, that seven-year tribulation period. But I believe very strongly uh, that if the Lord tarries his coming, we are headed towards a one-world government very quickly. Uh, The Antichrist and false prophet won't have enough time to initiate and inaugurate a one-world system. They're going to step into a fully developed, mature uh, one-world system. Uh, And so that leads us to the second question to ask, not only what are the implications for Bible prophecy, but secondly, you should ask, what are the implications for Satan's plot? And this kind of flows from the prophetic scriptures. God's word is very clear that uh, there is a cosmic battle taking place in the heavenlies. So each of these questions, by the way, I've tried to use a little bit of alliteration to help make it easier to remember. As you're sitting there watching Fox News or CNN or whatever you're reading, uh, you need to think, okay, what are the three things I need to be thinking about? Well, the first was Bible prophecy, now Satan's plot with a P. Uh, But the Bible is clear that we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness and uh, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan uh, tried to overcome God in the heavens. He led a coup. It didn't end well. His coup failed, and so he set his sights on earth. He wants all of God's created realm, especially his highest pinnacle of creation, mankind, to come under his rulership. He wants to defeat the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He wants to defeat the Almighty Creator God. So as we see things unfold and we watch the news, we should ask, 
what are the implications of all of this uh, for Satan's plot. So let's take a look at some uh, recent news items. Uh, back during the uh, control of virus scandemic, we saw lots of uh, coverage of the so-called Great Reset. Here's a Time Magazine cover from November 2020 showing how the globalists are going to completely reassemble the world under a new uh, model, a new paradigm, and I believe it's a satanic paradigm. The New York Times talked about the historical divide between B.C. and A.C. They call it before Corona and after Corona. The uh, Financial Times of London, same thing, same idea, B.C. and A.C. world. This is what I call the great satanic Reset, And it comes straight out of David's words in Psalm chapter 2, this great messianic psalm that explains biblically the conspiracy, the earthly side of the conspiracy. Uh, a conspiracy, of course, is just uh, three or more people uh, working together to accomplish something, three or more entities to, to accomplish something nefarious, usually in secret. The greatest conspiracy of all time is called the Luciferian conspiracy. That's a biblical term as well as their own uh, term, and it involves Satan leading uh, the conspiracy, uh, working in tandem with evil spirits in the unseen realm and human accomplices in the earthly realm. And David in Psalm 2 talks about the earthly aspect of that conspiracy, the human co-conspirators. He says, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? Remember, we're talking about what are the implications for Satan's plot as we read the news? How is this possibly uh, serving their agenda? Well, he goes on, the kings of the earth and the rulers, they all take counsel together. Who are they taking counsel against? The Lord and His anointed. That's Yahweh, the Creator, and His eternal Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And what are they saying to the triune Godhead? They're saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords. Satan hates the fact that God is sovereign. He wants control. He has control issues, and he's trying to tear down uh, God and break these bonds of control. But how does God respond? David goes on to say, God laughs at them and holds them in derision. And one day he will speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep pleasure. He says, because I have already set my king on my holy hill of Zion. See, even though Christ right now is not on the throne of David, he's at the th right hand of God on that throne, which is the throne in waiting. It's not the literal earthly throne of the kingdom. It's as if he already is. It's as good as done. From God's eternal perspective, God exists in the eternal now. He's outside of time, space, and matter. We think linearly. We know that from a human perspective, the kingdom is yet to come. It's down the road. I believe getting closer and closer. Uh, but from God's perspective, it's as good as done. It's already done. So that's the, the, the Luciferian conspiracy in a nutshell. Now, if we zoom in again on the, the human aspect of that, the people that are conspiring with Satan. I've diagrammed this out and discussed this at length in Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume 1. And again, you can go to spiritoftheantichrist.org if you don't already have that book, spiritoftheantichrist.org. But here's the diagram that I give in the book. Uh, it's at the top of this uh, sort of structure is a group of maybe six or eight families. Um, you can learn more about this by going to Fritz Springmeier's work. Uh, he's done the, the best work on all of this, uh, Bloodlines of the Illuminati, and another more recent book. Just search for uh, Fritz Springmeier on Amazon. Uh, I actually, or look in the bibliography of, of, of my uh, second volume. Uh, but it's just amazing uh, when you look back through ancient history and see these bloodlines of these of these human beings that are literally praying to Satan, taking their marching orders from him, uh, as distasteful and shocking as it might sound, it really shouldn't be because it, the Bible uh, talks about this quite plainly in the ancient Near East, but these are the people that even to this day are sacrificing children, drinking blood, and worshiping Satan. And, uh, and they then give the marching orders to the second tier. Now, one very important thing to remember about the, the, the Luciferian plot here is that it's not monolithic. It's that they're not omniscient or omnipresent or omnipotent. They can't push a button or give an order and, and make it happen automatically the way Almighty God does. God alone is sovereign. The Bible says God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. That is not true of Satan and his minions. Uh, so it's not uh, monolithic. Sometimes there are competing agendas. Often there are. There are rogue elements. There are people that get upset with other people and they do things that are off script. But nevertheless, Satan absolutely has a plan. He's working it out. 
in connection with his demons and uh, these human co-conspirators. And so at the second level, uh, you've got the, the business and finance realm. You've got secret societies. I talk about all of this in the book series, but there's hundreds of thousands of people at this level, many of whom are not aware that they are part of an overtly satanic agenda to take over the world. Most of them are. Most of them are at the top tier. This is the top level globalists. This is where our favorite uh, liberals that we that we don't like uh, the you know the likes of the you know the uh, George Soros, David Rockefeller, you know that that whole bunch, the Clintons, Obamas, and so forth. But it's not just the liberals. It's the global elites. It's the Bush dynasty. It's the Zbigniew Brzezinski's. It's the Henry Kissingers and and the like. So again, you got to stop thinking in terms of right left. You got to think in terms of Satan's minions. And at that level, those people certainly know that it's uh, satanic, but that's they're not the top tier. You don't know most of the names at the top tier. Uh, they're, they're the ones that sit in dark, smoke-filled rooms giving the orders. And then at the bottom level, you got millions of people uh, that are involved in this conspiracy in various categories like politics, uh, military and intelligence, religion, uh, the UN, and all of its uh, you know attendant organizations. Um, the vast majority of people at this level have no idea they're part of a larger plot. Um, at any of these levels, the, the bottom two levels anyway, uh, you've got people who are evil, they're doing evil things because of the depravity of man. They're in it for the power, the money, the sex, something like that. They may not, again, they may not realize they're part of a larger Luciferian plan. Many do. Many actually do. And if we've seen anything from the WikiLeaks and the Podesta emails and some of the other things that have come to light recently with Epstein, uh, we know there is a sick, dark, evil underworld uh, attached to these elites that emanates from Hollywood and from Washington, D.C. Uh, but uh, that said, there are many that, that don't necessarily participate overtly in satanic rituals, but they're pretty evil people. They have other fleshly agendas that are, are doing it. So uh, I always love to show this quote from Saul Alinsky because it just shows you that they think of Satan as the hero and God as the antagonist. They think God's the bad guy, Satan's the good guy in the Garden of Eden. And uh, Saul Alinsky, of course, who was uh, his famous book, Rules for Radicals, heavily influenced Obama, uh, and uh, he's just you know very widely uh, loved uh, by a lot of people. He, he died in 1972. But anyway, in, the, in his book, Rules for Radicals, he actually dedicates it to Lucifer. He says, lest we forget at least an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. Uh, this is the same guy, Saul Alinsky, who told Playboy magazine in a 1972 interview shortly before he died that he couldn't wait to get to hell because they're my kind of people. Folks, this is the way these people think. Uh, his earthly accomplices uh, think of Satan as the good guy, and uh, they are working out his plan. It's a futile plan, but they don't believe it. See, Satan uh, understands the Bible. He knows it better than most Christians. He just doesn't believe it. So he thinks he's going to win in the end. He thinks he'll win Armageddon. Uh, and uh, so he's, he's lining things up, preparing the way, using these human accomplices. Here's a, another quote. Uh, we don't have time to get into Operation Mockingbird and the way the state-run media is, is so controlled and manipulative. Uh, but this one, uh, if you haven't heard of this and we're not aware of Walter Cronkite's uh, Luciferian connections, this will blow you away. It's a 26-second quote taken uh, from uh, a meeting of the World Federalist Association where he was being given the Global Governance Award for all of his help in helping the elite try to usher in a one-world a government. Listen to what he says as he accepts the World Federalist Association's Global Governance Award. Award. Their leader, Pat Robertson, has written in a book a few years ago that we should have a world government, but only when the Messiah arrives. <laughs> he wrote, and literally, any attempt to achieve world order before that time must be the work of the devil. Well, join me. I'm, I'm glad to sit here at the right hand of Satan. I'm glad to sit here at the right hand of Satan. You, you heard how the elites in the audience just laughed derisively when he talked about conservative evangelicals who think that only Christ has the right to rule over the world. Uh, and then a little bit later in the presentation, uh, they pipe in by satellite uh, first lady at the time, Hillary Rodham Clinton. You guys know a little bit about her. Uh, and here's what she said. 
we would like to bring you a message from the First Lady of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Good evening and congratulations, Walter on receiving the World Federalist Association's Global Governance Award. For more than a generation in America, it wasn't the news until Walter Cronkite told us it was the news. Yeah, there's a little bit of a double entendre there. It wasn't the news until Walter Cronkite told us it was the news because uh, they are absolutely controlled. They're telling you what they want to tell you. That's been documented in the church committee hearings in Congress even. Uh, the whole talking point idea, you know, uh, Bill O'Reilly picked up on that terminology, but he didn't make it up. That was what the CIA called their memos that they gave to thousands of journalists, both in the print media and the television and radio media and eventually the online media. It says this is what you're going to cover, and, and it should be fairly self-evident if we weren't so blinded uh, and you know been controlled through the compulsory government schooling system and just culture itself in our upbringing. But when you think about it, it's a pretty big world out there. Eight what eight billion people or so. Lots going on in the world. It's a pretty big country as well. Three hundred and what fifty million people in America. On any given day, you'd think there's thousands of noteworthy, newsworthy items happening, and yet if you turn on the mainstream media, they're all covering the same thing. <laughs> Why? Because it's controlled. Uh, I don't have time to get into a whole lot about this guy, but I have a whole uh, chapter focused exclusively on Yuval Noah Harari. Uh, it's called A Wolf in Wolf's Clothing in the new book, uh, Spirit of the False Prophet. This guy is uh, Klaus Schwab's right-hand man, and uh, he is just, I think, really the, the mouthpiece right now for the coming one world system, or what they call the great reset, what I call the great satanic reset. Uh, he's got several choice uh, quotes. Um, he talks about how we are all now hackable animals. I'm just going to go through these uh, quickly because I want to play a short clip of his. But he talks about how Amazon and Google and Coke and, and, and the Russians and American and Chinese are all trying to hack you right now. Uh, he says, uh, really forget about school essays, you know, talking about AI, I have a whole chapter on AI. It's the most powerful chapter in the new book, chapter six, uh, talk about AI Jesus and what they're doing with all of that. But, uh, it, you know, he says, look, all this talk about people using AI and chat GPT to plagiarize essays in school and college and so forth, that's nothing. He says, what you really need to think about is the 2024 election and how they're going to use that to produce fake news stories, and even news scripture. So listen to this one and one and a half minute, 90 second or so clip talking. This is Harari at a TED Talk. This is several years ago, by the way, but he's just finished his TED Talk. You'll, you'll notice how people are just effusively applauding uh, all that he's just said. But I want to play you a, a segment of the Q&A at the end that the host has with him. Uh, and he you'll hear uh, how Harari talks about we just don't need so many humans. We got way too many humans. We need to get rid of them. Listen to this. Thank you. Wow. You well, you have a new book out. After Sapiens, you wrote another one, and uh, it's out in Hebrew, but not yet translated into. I'm, I'm working on the English. translation. As, uh, okay, as in you in, in in the book, if I understand it correctly, you argue that actually the amazing breakthrough that uh, we are experiencing right now, not only will potentially make our life better, but uh, they will create, and I quote you, new classes and new class struggles, just as the Industrial Revolution did. Can you elaborate for us? Yes, in the Industrial Revolution, we saw the uh, creation of a new class of the urban proletariat. And much of the political and social history of the last 200 years involved what to do with this class and the new problems and opportunities. Now we see the creation of a new massive class of useless people. As computers become better and better in more and more fields, so it is a distinct possibility that computers will outperform us in most tasks and will make humans redundant. And then the big political and economic question of the 21st century will be what do we need humans for, or at least what do we need so many humans for? Do you have an answer in the book? Um, at present, the best guess we have is uh, keep them happy with drugs and computer games. But this doesn't sound like a very appealing future. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, I mean, he caught himself there. What do we need humans for? And then he realized, wait a minute, I'm a human, at least for now. He's trying to become a transhuman, like all of the satanic elites. But he says, well, at least why do we need so many humans? Uh, and I talk about this extensively uh, in the new book, uh, how transhumanism uh, correlates with the, the one world system and this technocracy that they're uh, working on. The new book uh, is called, the, uh, the subtitle is The Rise of the Global Technocracy. A technocracy is just the use of technology to control the world. And uh, Satan uh, is not omnipresent or omniscient or omnipotent, as I said. So therefore, if Bible prophecy says that the Antichrist and false prophet, the, 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 you know, the, the first in command and the second in command during the tribulation, are going to control the whole world, the entire world, everyone in the world will be under their control with the mark of the beast, uh, then how are they going to do it? They're going to have to use uh, technology. One of the early leading technocrats who died in 2017 was Zbigniew Brzezinski. He was a Polish-American diplomat. He served in, in Republican and Democratic parties alike, uh, administrations alike. Arguably the most significant uh, foreign policy uh, analyst of the 20th century. But he wrote in his 1971 book, Between Two Ages... Uh, America's role in the technotronic era. He said, the post-industrial society is becoming a technotronic era or society, a society that is shaped culturally, psychologically, socially, and economically by the impact of technology uh, and uh, electronics. Uh, he said, such a society would be dominated by an elite uh, whose claim to political power would rest on allegedly superior scientific know-how. That's exactly what's happening Right now, the people that we esteem most highly, the Elon Musks and the Bill Gates of the world, are those that supposedly have superior scientific know-how. And he says, unhindered by the restraints of traditional liberal values, by liberal he means freedom, uh, you know, values of freedom and liberty, this elite would not hesitate to achieve its political ends by using the latest modern techniques for influencing public behavior and keeping society under close surveillance and control. I mean, it's right out of Revelation 13. He said, soon it will be possible to assert almost continuous surveillance over every citizen and maintain up-to-date complete files containing even the most personal information about the citizen. He says, persisting social crisis, the emergence of a charismatic personality, and the exploitation of mass media to obtain public confidence are the stepping stones in the piecemeal transformation of the United States into a highly controlled society. Remember, this was 71, and you know, here we are 50 years later, and it's coming uh, true. It was almost a reality before he died. He didn't get to see it across the finish line, uh, but they're rapidly there. They're on the one-yard line. Uh, one of the most uh, chilling things that he said shortly before he died in 2017 was, today it's infinitely easier to kill one million people than to control uh, one million people. So what we're talking about here is the New World Order. This is their term for it. Uh, they're all over. If you take the time to look for it, which I've done in, in my research over the last several years, you see it all over the place. It's no accident that the discovery of America was called the New World. This was to be a beachhead for the New World Order, advancing the globalist uh, agenda. But let me just quickly, before we get to the final point, zoom through a few uh, salient quotes. Here's Biden from March 21st, 2022, talking about how there's going to be a New World Order and we've got to lead it. Uh, he, When he was uh, vice president, he said, in setting the American agenda for the New World Order, we must begin with a profound alteration and traditional thought. Here's Kissinger. When Obama was elected, they, Obama was the first and so far only truly Manchurian presidential uh, man, and uh, they they really thought they had him completely under control, and they thought that in his day they were going to really usher in or at least get us much, much closer to the one world system. Uh, he went rogue in a couple of areas. Like I said, it's not monolithic. They're not completely all under the control of the top tier. But when he was elected, Kissinger said, well, boy, now we have a real chance to create this new world order. Uh, he said the new world order cannot happen without U.S. participation. Uh, yes, there's going to be a new world order, but it's going to force the United States to change its perceptions. He talked about when faced with a major threat, a global threat, uh, I don't know, like, for example, a global conflagration over Israel that involves Russia, Iran, potentially even China that eventually flares up and causes thousands of our troops and, and strike carriers to head over to the Middle East, you know, something like that. Eventually, uh, people will give up their rights 
in order to welcome the world government. Uh, Churchill said, after World War II, the creation of an authoritative world order is the ultimate aim toward which we must strive. Charles de Gaulle, same time period, World War II, the nations must unite in a world government or perish. James Paul Warburg of the uh, famous uh, uh, Warburg Bankster family helped start the uh, Federal Reserve in 1913. We shall have world government, whether you like it or not, by conquest or consent. He said that again around World, after World War II. George H.W. Bush famously said in his State of the Union address in 1991 in the context of the Gulf War, we can now seize this opportunity to fulfill the long-held promise of a new world order. Before him, Nixon met with uh, the uh, president of China, and together he said, each of us has a hope to build a new world order. During the Reagan administration, Gorbachev said, we're moving toward a new world order. What did H.G. Wells say in his famous book entitled The New World Order? He said, look, countless people are going to hate the New World Order and will die protesting against it. David Rockefeller famously said, we're on the verge of a global transformation. Uh, All we need is the right major crisis and everyone, all the nations of the world will unite and accept the New World Order. In his memoirs written shortly before he died, he also died in 2017 at the age of 101, In his memoirs, he admitted, look, some people believe we're part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the U.S., one world, if you will, Uh, building one world. Well, if that's the charge, I'm guilty and I'm proud of it, he said. Um, Just like uh, Cronkite's proud to sit at the right hand of Satan. These guys are proud that they're accomplishing this one world system. He says the world is now prepared to march uh, towards a world government. National sovereignty of uh, is no longer an option. Supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite is much, much better. So we talked about uh, what are the implications for Bible prophecy? What are the implications for Satan's plot? And then I want to close out by talking about the third question you should ask when interpreting the news. And that, are, that is, what are the implications for geopolitics? Uh, geopolitics relates to governance of nations and the geography of the nations and how that is changing and evolving and working uh, together. Uh, So the first thing that we absolutely should kind of have as a starting point is the rebirth of Israel as a nation. This is one of the biggest ways geopolitically that things are falling into place. Um, uh, You know, God's end times plan puts Israel front and center. It requires that Israel have a homeland to return to. And by the way, Israel owns the land. It's been Israel's land since God gave it to Abraham 2,000 years before Christ. It's not the Palestinians. It's the Holy Land. It's Israel's uh, land. And so uh, we see lots of references to this in Bible prophecy. The disciples wanted to know if Christ was going to restore the kingdom uh, some uh, 40 days after his resurrection on the Mount of Ascension. And he said, nope, not yet, but the Father's going to do that. And, and it's up to him when he does that. And when he does do that, Christ is going to come back and he's going to sit on the, te- uh, the throne of his glory in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Well, there has to be a Jerusalem. There has to be an Israel for that to happen. He's going to gather together his elect. That's Israel, the, the nation of Israel. His chosen nation is going to be regathered into the land, just as Deuteronomy promised. And every Old Testament prophet, prophet says the same thing about the great end times regathering of Israel into the land. Well, there has to be an Israel in the land for that to happen. And so what do we see happening? May 14th, 1948, the state of Israel is born after 1,800 of ye- years of there being no Israel on our Rand McNally maps, all of a sudden Israel is now a nation again, and it was reported all across the world. And so if we look at this map, Israel is in red, modern day Israel. The blue outline is what was promised to Israel in Genesis 15, the boundaries of the promised land, some 300,000 square miles. So Israel has never to this day fully occupied that land. So all of the saber rattling that we see happening there with Erdogan up in Turkey, uh, with uh, you know the the U.S. involved in a allegedly side skirmish, but I think it's directly related to Hamas and Iran in Syria. All of that is setting the stage uh, for uh, the world to come. Another geopolitical aspect that we need to keep our eye on today is the World Economic Forum. We all know about old Klaus Schwab. He and uh, Yuval Noah Harari, whom I just mentioned, are very uh, close. He's kind of Harari is one of his top. Uh, advisors. Uh, Klaus Schwab likes to appear in galactic garb, especially when making major announcements, and he's associated with all kinds of globalists. Uh, and, uh, you know, what, had, what did he say in his uh, book, The Great Reset? He said, we're looking for five pillars of the civilization that need to be reimagined, one of which is the geopolitical 
reset. They are wanting to restructure the world under a one-world tyrannical government, which the Antichrist and false prophet can then take over. In his next book after that, when the one that came out just last year, this is from 2022, called The Great Narrative, he said the geopolitical and technological landscapes are being reshaped in a way that will make them unrecognizable in just a few years. Remember, they're targeting 2030 uh, as kind of the end game in some of their own uh, leaked documents and white papers that they've written amongst themselves. It's clear that they think they're ahead of schedule. Uh, He says this is going to require all kinds of dramatic changes in our world. This comes straight out of Scripture, the ten horns, which are the ten kings that Revelation uh, talks about in Revelation 17. These are going to make war with the Lamb at the end of the tribulation, all coming together, uh, as we read about in Revelation 16 and Revelation 19, to do war with the returning Christ. Uh, The Club of Rome uh, was instrumental in starting the World Economic Forum. Uh, We could talk a lot more about that, but I have a, a lot to say about that in, in the book. The only reason I bring it up here is because the Club of Rome, interestingly enough, created in 1973 a 10-region division. Um, they called it the Regionalized and Adaptive Model of the Global World System. That 10 kingdoms uh, right out of the Bible. North America, Europe, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Russia and the Slavic nations, South and Central America, North Africa and Middle East, Central Africa, Southeast Asia and India, and uh, China. Uh, Another battle that everyone's talking about right now that is straight out of Scripture and relates to geopolitics is the battle of Gog and Magog. The Bible tells us that prior to uh, the return of Christ to establish his kingdom, there's going to be this northern alliance uh, from the land of Magog. That refers to modern southern Russia. Uh, That's quite clear from Scripture. And this northern aggressor is going to align himself with uh, these other nations, Persia, Ethiopia, Put, Gomer, Togarma. If you do the geography of what those ancient names for those lands were and what they're called today, we're talking about Iran. Sudan, Libya, Turkey, and Syria. Now, what do those nations along the bottom of the screen have in common? They're all in the news right now as they, in fulfilling a Bible prophecy, are preparing, setting the stage uh, to come against Israel. Now, I don't know if this is Gog and Magog. It certainly seems to be preparing the way for that. We don't know the timetable. Again, it could, you know, happen quickly. It may happen more slowly than we think, but I all week long on the Not By Works podcast, we had experts on Israel, uh, and I asked them all this same question, do you think this is the lead up to Gog and Magog? And every one of them said, yeah, it sure seems like it. I had Tom Hughes, I had John Haller, I had Bill Salas, I had uh, Dr. Randall Price, some of the top experts on Israel and Bible prophecy. But there's no question that Russia and Iran are working a hand in puppet. Uh, so, you know, what are the headlines? What are we seeing in the last two weeks? Uh, we're seeing this conflict, the worst conflict modern Israel has ever seen, the highest death toll. They have hundreds of thousands of Israeli soldiers and IDF on the ground now going in uh, to Gaza. Uh, Netanyahu says Israel's fighting on all fronts. That's uh, Hamas will be destroyed. They step up the attacks and form a war cabinet. We see other things happening. It's a trickle-down effect on the world economy. Here's J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon talking about how this is the most dangerous time for the world in decades in a recent interview with CNBC. Uh, CNN warns of far-reaching consequences if Israel doesn't stop the attacks on uh, Gaza. Just recently, on the 26th, two days ago, a top Iranian official threatened the United States during a U.N. speech accusing Israel of genocide and the U.S. and anyone who supports Israel will not be spared. Uh, So there's all kinds of rhetoric. This is from that same day, Pentagon, breaking news, Pentagon outlines U.S. troops, weapons deployments in the Middle East from October the 26th. So how to interpret the news? Well, as you read the news, remember those preliminary principles that I talked about. Nothing is as as it seems. Uh, It's never about what it's about. And then ask yourself, what are the implications for what I'm seeing or hearing or reading for Bible prophecy? See, nothing can happen that thwarts God's prophecies. It's all setting the stage. What are the implications for Satan's plot? And what are the implications for 
uh, geopolitics. And so again, the most recent book uh, gets into a lot of this. Uh, it's kind of part of a, a three-book triad. They all kind of stand alone, so you can read any one of them in any order that you want, but they're kind of all dealing with the same broad subject of end times prophecy and Satan's plan uh, to kind of... Uh, uh, take over the world. Uh, I've got uh, lots of other resources for the end times. These are a couple of other end times books. I mentioned Great Last Days Deception and my uh, eschatology textbook from all my years in academia when I was teaching full time called What Lies Ahead, a biblical overview of the end times. All of the charts that, that I've used are available in our chart book, which is available in print or digital format. So you can, uh, you can check that out. All right. With that, um, I'm going to kind of shift gears now into a Q&A. Again, thanks for giving me so much time and I'll take as I'll, you know, allow you as much time as you need to get all of your uh, all of your questions answered. So I'll turn it over to Don now. Thank you, Dr. Hickson. So any questions, I'll repeat them up here. So we can hear them. All right, Patty. He said that a new speaker, Mike Johnson, is not who you think he is. Can you elaborate on it? All right. So the question is, can you give us any more elaboration on new speaker Johnson? Yeah, he is a longtime a puppet of the globalists. Uh, he's playing the role of Christian. It's amazing to me uh, to see how easily they are able to dupe uh, conservative evangelical Christians. It's 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 unfortunately it's kind of sad, really, that Christians ought to be the most discerning, as Paul said in First Thessalonians five. Uh, six that I quoted earlier. Uh, but yeah, he's not who he thinks he is. Um, I would encourage, and it would be very instructive to just do your own research. You know, you, it's, it's not that difficult. It takes time and you got to do some digging. You got to come up with some creative, um, you know, uh, Boolean search strings on, on Google to kind of find data, uh, look beyond the headlines. But right now what they're doing is posturing him, uh, to, to kind of win over in this election year, this coming election, uh, the evangelicals, it's the same way Trump, uh, you know, met with 2,000 evangelicals in Times Square at the Marriott there. I happened to be at the hotel the same time that was happening. I was doing some speaking in the Northeast. I wasn't invited uh, to that uh, invitation-only meeting of top evangelical leaders. For one thing, I'm not a top evangelical leader, but number two, I was quite vocal in my uh, telling the truth about Trump and his long sordid history in the porn and gambling industries and, and, and so forth, and what he was even doing, you know, even after he supposedly came to faith in Christ. Uh, but I know people who were there. I've talked to them firsthand. And, and you know, it was a sense, essentially a chance to pull one over on the Christians that, you know, this guy's a Christian. You need to vote for him. And uh, he was just a pawn. He was put in place to roll out the pandemic and the death shot, uh, which he still is out there touting. When they were through with him, they cast him aside. That's why the greatest rigged election of all time was 2020. No question about that. They've all been rigged. It was rigged in 2016 to put Trump in there. It's not an election. It's selections, remember. Uh, but he is kind of a rogue element, and he's his own man. Everybody knows that. We 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 resonate when he says things that we like, and we go, go get him, because he's quite the, quite the guy. But he also is not going to be allegiant to anybody. And so after they used him for their purposes, they wanted to make sure he was not going to get in. And of course, he has a huge populist following, and Mike Johnson is in that same realm. And uh, so they, because he had such a huge populist following, they had to uh, rig the election worse than ever before. And of course, it you know, it, they, they were caught. But of course, when you control all of the ju judicial systems, all the appellate courts, when you control it all, you, you know, no one's going to win that battle. I'm personal friends with Jenna Ellis. I uh, had her on my program before. I've been on her program before. Um, and you saw recently she was just the latest one to, I think, get a raw deal because, you know, uh, she was simply telling the truth and trying to expose the rigged election. But it was rigged in 2016. It was rigged in 2012, 08, 04, 2000, going all the way back. Uh, so I believe what they're doing now is once again beginning to set the stage to get conservatives to come on board whoever the latest uh, puppet on the right is. But I would just encourage you to uh, you know, to, to do some research on your own. Find out the kind of questions you want to ask are what, what's his view on abortion historically? What's his view on um, human rights? Uh, 
know, for example, a lot of people don't realize Ron DeSantis was, uh, in his previous life, he was the one that was in charge of Gitmo for the, uh, you know, to, to, to make sure that there were no civil, uh, human rights violations taking place there, make sure there was no torture. And of course, there was immense torture going on, and he just signed off on all of it. He's also skull and bones, by the way. Uh, so I think you just have to dig a little deeper than the official bios that you're going to see on the news. So sorry for the long answer, but I think it, it kind of gives you some fodder there. Yeah. Well, yeah. Do you see any hatred in this world of giants from a coming out of Washington, D.C.? Is there anybody that you do support? Uh, if you can hear that. So the question is, uh, like David and Goliath, do you see anybody that could be the David in this political landscape that could help fight off the Goliath? Yeah, so that's, you know, I don't think you're going to like my answer necessarily, so I want to be gracious and, you know, encourage you. Here's what I believe. I believe that if you believe your vote counts, you absolutely should vote. You should vote with a biblical worldview. You should vote uh, for God's candidate. Uh, I think David's a great example. That's a great metaphor. I, I've actually written about that about uh, back in 2012. It caused me to become disenfranchised with a lot of Republican conservative groups because I did not support Romney. Uh, and I said, uh, you know, I use David as an example. You know, when uh, Samuel came along and uh, he asked Jesse, you know, let's see all your sons, all the normal popular candidates, the ones that could win, you know, we want the guys that can win, you know, these third party candidates, they can't win. So we're just going to go with a Satan worshiper, you know, Mitt Romney, who is a Satan worshiper, by the way, he's a Mormon. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I use that example that, you know, Jesse's like, I don't have anybody else. Well, I got this one little scrawny kid out in the, you know, field, you know, feeding the sheep, but surely he's not the one. Samuel said, let me see him. And he's the one. So I think philosophically, the Theologically, biblically, if you believe your vote counts, you should absolutely vote and vote your conscience biblically. The problem is I don't believe in pretend voting. And I've researched this ad nauseum. Again, I talked about it back in my 2012 book. It's all a rigged game. It's not an election. It's a selection. You, you go into these booths, you pretend to vote, then you sit back and you watch the media, state-run, globalist-controlled media tell you who the next president's going to be. You have no chain of custody of the ballots. You have no physical ballots. Even if you do have a physical ballot, you can't. Th those don't matter. What matters is the dots and dashes on a computer screen on a server somewhere where lots of you know congressional hearings and, and independent studies, books, journal articles have been written about how easy it is to manipulate the vote. A, a computer whiz kid at 18 years old can be sitting in a computer to terminal or cubicle somewhere and with a few keystrokes and a $100,000 paycheck from some elite change the outcome of the election in any state anywhere in the country. So it's completely rigged. And I just refuse to be made a fool of. I just don't believe in pretend voting. When I was a kid, we used to have pretend votes. We'd play house. We'd play, you know, all kinds of imaginary games. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just don't want to be made the fool of. You know, they have elections in Iran. They have elections in, you know, North Korea and you know, no Christian living underground there hiding out from persecution is going to vote there because they know it's obviously a foregone conclusion. I think that's what I mean when I say things are much worse than people think they are. Now to your question. As, I, as you'll notice on my preliminary comments, I said most congressmen are controlled. Um, that's because every two years we elect new congressmen and they cannot control every voting district. And every two years, inevitably, there's a handful of God-fearing, patriotic men and women who want to serve their country, want what's best for our country. And so uh, they get in, uh, and then they're very quickly controlled or, or, or compromised in some way. And I have firsthand knowledge of this. I can, you know, I could elaborate that on if we have time. But... Uh, and so, but even if they don't, they don't have to control all of them. They leave a few out there to kind of make you think you have a voice. Uh, so if I had confidence in the sanctity of our voting system, absolutely, I believe we could, uh, we could see a David rise up and turn this country around, but not until we absolutely ban 100% the digital vote tabulation machines uh, because as long as, you know, if you can hack into the NSA servers, which they've done, uh, you can hack into a vote tabulation machine, I assure you. So hopefully that helps clarify. Vicki, did you have a question? 
Yeah, no. Okay. So, what should our role as Christians be in these last of the last days? Give us your thoughts on the role as a Christian in the last of the last days. Yeah, great question. Um, in all three of the books, the final chapter or towards the end, I have a chapter on, you know, kind of the so what question. What do we do with this information? Chapter nine of the new book is uh, is our preparedness guide, what Christians should be doing to prepare for what's to come. Um, you know, I, I believe uh, in, you know, there's a, there's a concept called the normalcy bias, which basically says that... Um, you know, it's what uh, people that aren't awake suffer from when they can't believe this is really happening. Like, I'm sure there's a little bit of normalcy bias that manifesting itself uh, for those of you who, like me and my parents before me, really thought that one of the most sacrosanct things in this country and that's this great country of ours was the ability to vote. Uh, and and at once upon a time it was, but unfortunately now it's all pretend and I just refuse to be made a fool of that. Some of you might be not, that might not sit well and you might not say this guy, you know, I don't, I don't agree with that. That's normalcy bias. But there's another thing called abnormalcy bias. Abnormalcy bias is for those who are awake, who understand Bible prophecy, who see the state of affairs in the world, and we have this tendency to think it's all going to come to an end tomorrow. It's kind of the chicken little concept. It's all the sky is falling tomorrow. Um, the sky might fall tomorrow, but in the meantime, what should Christians be doing? We need to be doing what God's Word tells us to do, which is the Great Commission. We need to wake up every day asking ourselves, how can we glorify God? How can we raise our children? How can we make a difference in this sin-stricken world? Paul says we are to shine like lights in a perverse generation. None of that's changed. Uh, this is not the time to wave the white flag of surrender, move to a mountaintop, climb in a hole, and sing Kumbaya. Now's the time to continue serving the Lord, eyes wide open, realizing that there's a lot going on and we do need to be prepared. Remember, Proverbs says the wise person sees trouble coming and prepares for it. Uh, we trust the Lord. Obviously, that's a given. That's the, the whole premise of the Christian life is we walk by faith, not by sight. But at the same time, knowing what's happening, you'd be foolish not to take precautions and prepare for the kinds of things that I believe if the Lord tarries is coming are going to happen. So uh, I, we share the gospel all the time, everywhere we go. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, for the purposes of the uh, the video here, you know, uh, I've said it several times that Christ died for our sins and rose from our dead for for, for our, rose from the dead. But the only hope of eternal life is to place your faith in Jesus Christ. That more than 160 times the New Testament conditions eternal life upon faith alone in Christ alone. That's the only means. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. That's the premise of our ministry, not by works. We've been around since 1999. Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So now more than ever, there's an urgency to this gospel enterprise. We need to be sharing the good news with others, and we need to make sure that we've placed our faith in Christ. You know, there's a lot of people sitting in churches and sitting in prophecy conferences who think they're saved because they walked an aisle, signed a card, you know, uh, made a commitment of some kind, but the commitments don't save you. Salvation is not a bilateral contract where we commit something and God says, okay, I'll take your commitment now, you're going to heaven. It's a unilateral gift. We do nothing but come empty handed, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling, and we trust in Jesus Christ who died and rose again for our sins as the only one who can forgive us and give us eternal life. So, I think, uh, you know, what we raised our children to do, we woke up, as I said, 17 years ago, we continued to live life. Uh, but we know what's coming. We see through the biblical lens and we're, we're living life, but with a different vantage point. So hopefully that helps. It does. Uh, any other questions? I think we have one more doubt and I'll have to All right. Um, what are the key things because the day passage of the they can't cancel um, Robert Kennedy Jr.? Yeah. If that is some kind of uh, something Christians should pay attention to? All right. Um, so, JB, here's the Here's the question. I'll, I'll kind of paraphrase it here. With what the Democrats are doing to Robert Kennedy, trying to cancel and quiet him, the question was, is that something we should pay attention to? How should we interpret that? Thoughts on that? Yeah. So when you say Democrats, I assume you mean Democans. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I tell you what, you know, 
there are real organic truth tellers out there that are controlled. As I said, not everything is controlled. There are real things that happen. Um, and so you always need to allow for that possibility. Um, and so, I, you know, Robert Kennedy, I really appreciated his sounding the alarm and raising the flag about, you know, the death shots and uh, he and several other people that, that I've had the chance to interact with, like Dr. Lee Merritt uh, and, and several of the, the, the key doctors that were out there sounding the alarm. And in Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume 1, I have 50 pages on big pharma and vaccines with incontrovertible smoking gun evidence from thousands of doctors across the globe in all different countries that uh, you know gave evidence that indeed this was pre-planned and that the vaccine is not a vaccine. It's a gene-altering bio-injection. So I appreciated his stand on that. Um, I don't, it's too early to tell whether he is an, a, a complicit pawn in the game, but I do think the Luciferians are propping him up because there has to be a narrative. See, what happened regarding an election, what happened in 2020 is anyone with half a brain understood there is absolutely no way that Sleepy Joe won that election. I mean, you just, it was probably, if the real votes were counted, in, in, you know, literal, legitimate votes, uh, you probably were looking somewhere along 70% uh, support for Trump in the populace. Uh, now, never mind what I think about Trump and what, you know, what you think about Trump. I'm just saying in real numbers, people, he had a huge following. And so that's where they made their mistake. They let it they let uh, they underestimated the power of the populace, and so therefore it made the uh, announcement of the selection for that year far less credible. So they tried to prop up unwittingly people to kind of create a narrative that is more plausible, and especially after Biden's first term. And by the way, my my take on Biden is he's the fur, which is another sign of the times that I think indicates we're getting closer to the end of the globalist agenda. He's the first truly placeholder candidate, meaning he literally is doing nothing. He may not even be alive. Uh, that's another story. But he's he's literally just a placeholder. There are other people that are pulling the strings. They just needed someone to sit behind the desk and be to hold that position. Uh, in the past, you've had key leaders that they were all puppets to be sure, but they, they, they had power, they had a brain, they could think they did some things sometimes that the globalists didn't want them to do so forth and so on. So anyway, you know, as we think about this coming election, uh, assuming Biden is the candidate, there's absolutely no way they can pull another one off on whoever's in there. And it, it could be Trump, you know, who knows? I mean, things are so mixed up right now. It's crazy. Uh, and by the way, I'm not in favor of what they're doing to Trump. I think it's a banana republic and no candidate should be arrested because he contested an election which needed to be contested. But I don't, I don't think he's, you know, he's our guy. I don't think he's at all promoting biblical principles. Um, so I think, and this is just my opinion, I could be completely wrong, but I, it's early. But it wouldn't surprise me if they're creating a narrative for this third party candidate, kind of like they did with Perot to give a plausible reason to put uh, Clinton in there. <clears throat> Remember, Clinton won the election in 92 with only 43% of the popular vote. Uh, stunning, you know. Um, and so I think we could see a similar thing happen uh, in 24 if, if they want Biden in. Now, remember, depending on what their plan is and where they are on their plan, and of course, depending on whether God is ready to enter this final phase, because he's the ultimate arbiter of the timetable, it doesn't really matter what the game plan for the Luciferians is. You know, God has to say, okay, let's go. Let's move into the end times. But assuming all of that, they may want a Republican in there that's under their control, uh, just like they used Trump to roll out the uh, pre-planned uh, pandemic. Uh, so... Uh, so I, you know, that that's kind of my take on, on that. Hopefully, that gives you some thoughts. All right, we had we had another question. Um, do you think that the twenty thirty agenda will be realized by twenty thirty, or could it even be earlier? Yeah, I think it could definitely be earlier. I write a lot about that. I have a whole chapter on Agenda 21, which was the 21st century, and Agenda 2030 in uh, Volume 2. 
uh, and it's a chapter called the Luciferian Timeline. Very worth reading that chapter. But yeah, they seem to be ahead of the game. See, the pandemic was was planned way ahead of time. They needed something to get Christians in particular to bow down and worship the government. And so for the first time since Constantine in the 400s, we have we had churches not worshiping Jesus on Easter Sunday. And if President Hillary Rodham Clinton had stood up and told Christians not to go to church on Easter, there would have been a civil war. But because Trump did it, Everybody said, yes, sir, right away, sir. And so we had roughly 90% of evangelical Christians, conservatives, uh, you know, locked down and, and shut down their businesses, shut down their churches. Um, by the way, an outstanding film, if you haven't seen it, I don't think it's in the theaters anymore, but it's a documentary called The Essential Church. Find it on one of the streaming platforms and watch it. it it'll, it'll really embolden you for, I think, what's coming next. Uh, great film. But uh, The Essential Church. The, the, yeah, sorry, we're, we're showing it here Friday night. Oh, perfect. Okay, good. Well, I'm not a MacArthur fan for other theological reasons, but I believe in giving credit where credit's due, and it's a extremely uh, in, you know encouraging and emboldening uh, film. But um, uh, so so again, you know, back to the elections. Um, or what were what were we just talking about? I lost my train of thought. Oh, the 2030s. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I do think it seems like they were very pleasantly surprised with how easily they got people to, to roll over. Um, and uh, so I think they've moved up the timeline. At least they've said they have. Again, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. But, um, you know, I think 24, 25, those are going to be key years if, if the Lord doesn't come back before then, which he certainly could. Uh, but, yeah, I think it could happen sooner. Hey, JB, I got another question for you. It's hard to filter out kind of the fake news. Do you have any sites or places you would suggest as a Christian to get the news through a biblical lens? You know, you really can't. You, you can get, there are sources out there, independent alt, alt media sources that generally speaking are going to tell you what's happening. And then you're going to have to interpret it yourself because everybody has an agenda, even the alt media. You know, right now you're seeing a lot of people in the conspiracy world who correctly understand that things are not as they appear, that there's a global elite or they call it the deep state or things like that, uh, trying to take over the world. But unfortunately, they're not connecting the dots biblically. So they're anti-Semitic. They're, they think the Zionists are the tip of the spear. They, they don't get it. So, but you can get good information from some of those people. So I think... That's what I try to do in this presentation is think in terms of those three arenas, Bible prophecy, Satan's plot, because you can learn a lot about his plot from his human accomplices, what they're saying. And then, of course, geopolitics. Um, you know, there are sources like uh, uh, World uh, Joel Skousen's World Affairs Brief. Uh, that's a paid subscription. He's pretty spot on. He gives you certainly an alternative viewpoint of what the mainstream arguments are. Um, I think it's worldaffairsbrief.net or .com. Um, and yes, I'm aware that he comes from a, a Mormon background. His uncle is the one who wrote The Naked Communist, a very famous book uh, about the grand conspiracy. Uh, but I think he's a believer now based on my interaction with him. But even if he's not, you know, he's got good information. You know, that's the thing. When you study this stuff, it's kind of like if you have, uh, you know, if you need brain surgery. If my wife needed brain surgery, God forbid, I'm going to, I want the best brain surgeon available. I really don't care if he's a Christian or not. I hope he is, and I'll maybe get the chance to share Christ with him. But my priority is his skills. When your house is on fire, you call the fire department and you don't say, hey, find me a Christian fireman. You say, get here quick. So, you know, some of these uh, people have expertise in areas that we don't, irrespective of the fact that they may not know the Lord Jesus. So Joel Skousen's one. There are so-called conservative news outlets out there that are going to expose some of the blatant lies of the left, but they're also going to trumpet the the propaganda and talking points of the right and and refer back to my second point today mm -hmm. remember they're pushing us both it's a one-way street we're all headed the same direction just from different uh, vantage points so uh, you know I, I think you just have to learn to you know it, so, interpret the the news yourself really all right any other questions 
Uh, the question earlier was how will we have access to this video? Will it be on your site? Yep. So we'll post it uh, here within probably 15 minutes. We'll get it posted to our Rumble channel, and it'll be right on uh, the Not By Works website. So uh, it'll be uh, probably in the first place of our highlight carousel, or you can uh, click on the menu of videos, and it'll be click on all videos. It'll be there. But Rumble, our website, it'll be posted there. We will also post an audio only version to our podcast channel. So there are a lot of people like to just you know listen to the podcast rather than watch because they're driving or working. So it'll the audio and video both will be posted. All right. Good. Well, hey, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hickson. Really appreciate the time you've given us today and uh, uh, really grateful for the insights that you've given and, and allowing us to even do some Q&A. Oh, my pleasure. You know, really, really grateful and I uh, love you guys. And again, you know, I'm not perfect. I, some of the things I've said, you know, may not pan out to be true. So do your own research. Um, but hopefully this kind of gives you some framework to really dive in. These are interesting times. And so uh, uh, shall I close this in prayer? That'd be awesome. Yes. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for, for this time together. Lord, we, we are so thankful for your grace. Thankful that we have a rock on which to stand in the midst of very turbulent uh, waves right now. Uh, Lord, we thank you most of all for your grace by which we are saved, uh, undeserved, uh, totally free, paid for by the blood of your Son and our Savior. Lord, I thank you for Faith Baptist and what you're doing in their midst. I pray that you'd just continue to help them to make a difference in Springdale and uh, across the globe through their mission work. And Lord, we just pray that you'd protect our families, give us wisdom to know how to uh, prepare for what, what lies ahead, and uh, help us to remain faithful. Help us to be able to say, uh, that, uh, like Paul did, that we fought the good fight and we finished the race strong. And so, Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen, guys. Thank you very much. You, you bet. We'll get this posted.